The Life, Crime, and Capture of John Wilkes Booth by George Alfred Townsend. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Letter 9. The Executions. Washington, Friday, July 7th. The trial is over. Four of the conspirators have paid with their lives the penalty of the great conspiracy. The rest go to jail, and with one exception for the remainder of their lives. Whatever our individual theories may be, the great crime is ended, and this is the crowning scene. It was a long and dusty avenue, along which rambled soldiers in bluishly white coats, cattle with their tongues out, straying from the herd, and a few negroes making for their cabins, which dotted the fiery and vacant lots of the suburbs. At the foot of this avenue, where a lukewarm river holds between its dividing arms a dreary edifice of brick, the way was filled with collected cabs and elbowing people, abutting against a circle of sentinels who kept the arsenal gate. The low, flat, dust-white fields to the far left were also lined with patrols and soldiers lying on the ground in squads beside their stacked muskets. Within these a second blue and monotonous line extended. The drive from the arsenal gate to the arsenal's high and steel-spiked wall was beset by companies of exacting sabermen, and all the river bank to the right was edged with blue and bayonets. This exhibition of war was the prelude to a very ghastly but very popular episode, an execution. Three men and a woman were to be led out in shackles and hung to a beam. They had conspired to take life. They had thrilled the world with the partial consummation of their plot, they were to reach the last eminence of assassins on this parched and oppressive noon by swinging in pinioned arms and muffled faces in the presence of a thousand people. The bayonets at the gate were lifted as I produced my pass. It was the last permission granted. In giving it away the general seemed relieved, for he had been sorely troubled by applications. Everybody who had visited Washington to seek for an office sought to see this expiation also. The officer at the gate looked at my pass suspiciously. I don't believe that all these papers have been genuine, he said. Is an execution then so great a warning to evildoers that men will commit forgery to see it? I entered the large grassy yard surrounded by an exceedingly high wall. On the top of this wall soldiers with muskets in their hands were thickly planted. The yard below was broken by irregular buildings of brick. I climbed by a flight of rickety outside stairs to the central building, where many officers were seated at the windows, and looked a while at the strange scene on the grassy plaza. On the left the long, barred, impregnable penitentiary rose. The shady spots beneath it were occupied by huddling spectators. Soldiers were filling their canteens at the pump. A face or two looked out from the barred jail. There were many umbrellas hoisted on the ground to shelter civilians beneath them. Squads of officers and citizens lay along the narrow shadow of the walls. The north side of the yard was enclosed on three sides by columns of soldiers drawn up in regular order, the side next to the penitentiary being short to admit of ingress to the prisoner's door, but the opposite column reached entirely up to the north wall. Within this enclosed area a structure to be inhabited by neither the living nor the dead was fast approaching completion. It stood gaunt, lofty, long. Saws and hammers made dolorous music on it. Men in their shirt-sleeves were measuring it and directing its construction in a business way. Now and then someone would ascend its airy stair to test its firmness. Others crawled beneath to wedge its slim supports or carry away the falling debris. Toward this skeleton edifice all looked with a strange nervousness. It was the thought and speculation of the gravest and the gayest. It was the gallows. A beam reached horizontally in the air twenty feet from the ground. Four awkward ropes at irregular intervals dangled from it, each noosed at the end. It was upheld by three props, one in the center and one at each end. These props came all the way to the ground where they were mortised in heavy bars. Midway of them a floor was laid, twenty by twelve feet, held in its position on the farther side by shorter props, of which there were many, and reached by fifteen creaking steps, railed on either side. 
but this floor had no supports on the side nearest the eye except two temporary rods at the foot of which two inclined beams pointed menacingly held in poise by ropes from the gallows floor and this floor was presently discovered to be a cheat a trap a pitfall two hinges only held it to its firmer half these were to give way at the fatal moment and leave only the shallow and unreliable air for the bound and smothering to tread upon the traps were two sustained by two different props the nooses were on each side of the central support was this all not all close by the foot of the gallows four wooden boxes were piled upon each other at the edge of four newly excavated pits the fresh earth of which was already dried and brittle in the burning noon here were to be interred the broken carcasses when the gallows had let go its throttle they were so placed as the victims should emerge from the jail door they would be seen near the stair directly in the line of march and not far from these in silence and darkness beneath the prison where they had lain so long and so forebodingly the body of john wilkes booth sealed up in the brick floor had long been mouldering if the dead can hear he had listened many a time to the rattle of their manacles upon the stairs to the drowsy hum of the trial and the buzz of the garrulous spectators to the moaning or the jibing or the praying in the bolted cells where those whom kindred fate had given a little lease upon life lay waiting for the terrible pronouncement it was a long waiting and the roof of a high house outside the walls was seen to be densely packed with people others kept arriving moment by moment soldiers were wondering when the swinging would begin and officers arguing that the four folks deserved it damn them gentlemen of experience were telling over the number of such expiations they had witnessed analytic people were comparing the various modes of shooting garroting and guillotining cigars were sending up spirals of soothing smoke there was a good deal of covert fear that a reprieve might be granted inquiries were many and ingenuous for whiskey and one or two were so deeply expectant that they fell asleep how much more those four dying hoping cringing dreaming felons were grudged their little gasp of life it was to be a scene not a postponement or a prolongation who was to be the executioner why had not the renowned and artistic isaacs been sent for from new york would they probably die game or grow weak kneed in the last extremity ah the gallows workmen have completed the job now then we should have it still there was delay the sun peeped into the new-made graves and made blistering hot the gallows floor the old pump made its familiar music to the cool plash of blessed water the grass withered in the fervid heat the bronzed faces of the soldiers ran lumps of sweat the file upon the jail walls looked down into the wide yard yawningly no wind fluttered the two battle standards condemned to unfold their trophies upon this coming profanation not yet arrived why the extent of grace had almost been attained the sentence gave them only till two o'clock why are they so dilatory in wishing to be hanged suddenly the wicket opens the troops spring to their feet and stand at order arms the flags go up the low order passes from company to company the spectators huddle a little nearer to the scaffold all the writers for the press produce their pencils and notebooks first came a woman pinioned a middle-aged woman dressed in black bonneted and veiled walking between two bareheaded priests one of these held against his breast a crucifix of jet and in the folds of his blue fringed sash he carried an open breviary while both of them muttered the service for the dead four soldiers with musket at shoulder followed and a captain led the way to the gallows the second party escorted a small and shambling german whose head had a long white cap upon it rendering more filthy his dull complexion and upon whose feet the chains clanked as he slowly advanced preceded by two officers flanked by a lutheran clergyman and followed as his predecessor 
by an armed squad. The third preacher and party clustered about a shabby boy, whose limbs tottered as he progressed. The fourth walked in the shadow of a straight high stature, whose tawny hair and large blue eyes were suggestive rather of the barbarian striding in his conqueror's triumph than the assassin going to the gallows. All these, captives, priests, guards, and officers, nearly twenty in all, climbed slowly and solemnly the narrow steps, and upon four armchairs, stretching across the stage in the rear of the traps, the condemned were seated with their spiritual attendants behind them. The findings and warrants were immediately read to the prisoners by General Hartroft, in a quiet and respectful tone, an aide holding an umbrella over him, meantime, these having been already published, and being besides very uninteresting to anybody but the prisoners, were paid little heed to, all the spectators interesting themselves in the prisoners. There was a fortuitous delicacy in this distribution, the woman being placed farthest from the social and physical dirtiness of Atzerott, and nearest the unblanched and manly physiognomy of pain. She was not so pale that the clearness of her complexion could not be seen, and the brightness of the sun made her veil quite transparent. Her eyes were seen to be of a soft grey. Her brown hair lay smoothly upon a full, square forehead. The contour of her face was comely, but her teeth had the imperfectness of those of most southern women, being few and irregular. Until the lips were opened she did not reveal them. Her figure was not quite full enough to be denominated buxom, yet had all the promise of venerable old age had nature been permitted its due course. She was of medium height and modest, as what woman would not be under such searching survey. At first she was very feeble, and leaned her head upon alternate sides of her armchair in nervous spasms. But now and then, when a sort of wail just issued from her lips, the priest placed before her the crucifix to lull her fearful spirit. All the while the good fathers, Wigget and Walter, murmured their low, tender cadences, and now and then the woman's face lost its deadly fear and took a bold cognizable survey of the spectators. She wore a robe of dark woolen, no collar, and common shoes of black listing. Her general expression was that of acute suffering, vanishing at times as if by the conjuration of her pride, and again returning in a paroxysm as she looked at the dreadful rope dangling before her. This woman, to whom the priests have made their industrious moan, holding up the effigy of Christ when their own appeals became of no avail, perched there in the lofty air, counting her breaths, counting the winkfuls of light, counting the final wrestles of her breaking heart, had been the belle of her section, and many good men had courted her hand. She had led a pleasant life, and children had been born to her who shared her mediocre ambition and the invincibility of her will. If the charge of her guilt were proven, she was the Lady Macbeth of the West. But women know nothing of consequences. She alone of all her sex stands now in this thrilled and ghastly perspective, and in immediate association with three creatures in whose company it is no fame to die. A little crying boy, a greasy, unkempt sniveller, and a confessed desperado. Her base and fugitive son, to know the infamy of his cowardice and die of his shame, should have seen his mother writhing in her seat upon the throne his wickedness established for her. Payne, the strangest criminal in our history, was alone dignified and self-possessed. He wore a closely fitted knit shirt, a sailor's straw hat tied with a ribbon, and dark pantaloons, but no shoes. His collar, cut very low, showed the tremendous muscularity of his neck, and the breadth of his breast was more conspicuous by the manner in which the pinioned arms thrust it forward. His height, his vigor, his glare made him the strong central figure of this inter-elementary tableau. He said no word. His eyes were red as with the penitential weeping of a courageous man, and the smooth hardness of his skin seemed like a polished muscle. He did not look abroad inquisitively, nor within intuitively. He had no accusation, no despair, no dreaminess. He was only looking at death as for one long expected, 
and not a tremor nor a shock stirred his long, stately limbs. With all, his blue eye was milder than when I saw him last, as if some bitterness or stolidness or obstinate pride had been exorcised, perhaps by the candor of confession. Now and then he looked half-pityingly at the woman, and only once moved his lips as if in supplication. Few who looked at him, forgetful of his crime, did not respect him. He seemed to feel that no man was more than his peer, and one of his last commands was a word of regret to Mr. Seward. I have no doubt that this man is entirely a member of our nervous race. I believe that a fiber of the aboriginal runs through his tough sinews. At times he looked entirely an Indian. His hair is tufted, and will not lie smoothly. His cheekbones are large and high-set. There is a tint in his complexion. Perhaps the seminal blood of his swampy state left a trace of its combative nature there. Payne was a preacher's son, and not the worst graduate of his class. His real name is Lewis Thornton Powell. He died without taking the hand of any living friend. Even the squalid Atzerodt was not so poor. I felt a pity for his physical rather than his vital or spiritual peril. It seemed a profanation to break the iron column of his neck and give to the worm his belted chest. But I remember that he would have slain a sick old man. The third condemned, though whimpering, had far more grit than I anticipated. He was inquisitive and flippant-faced, and looked at the noose flaunting before him, and the people gathered below, and the haggard face of Atzerodt, as if entirely conscious and incapable of abstraction. Harold would have enjoyed this execution vastly as a spectator. He was, I think, capable of a greater degree of depravity than any of his accomplices. Atzerodt might have made a sneak thief, Booth a forger, but Harold was not far from a professional pickpocket. He was keen-eyed, insolent, idle, and by a small experience in Houston Street would have been qualified for a first-class Canuck. He had not, like the rest, any political suggestion for the murder of the heads of the nation, and upon the gallows, in his dirty felt hat, soiled cloth coat, light pantaloons and stockings, he seemed unworthy of his manacles. A very fussy Dutchman tied him up and fanned him, and he wept forgetfully, but did not make a halt or absurd spectacle. Atzerodt was my ideal of a man to be hung, a dilution of Wallach's rendering of the last hours of Fagin the Jew, a sort of sick man, quite garrulous and smitten, with his head thrown forward, muttering to the air, and a pallidness transparent through his dirt as he jabbered prayers and pleas confusedly, and looked in a complaining sort of way at the noose, as if not quite certain that it might not have designs upon him. He wore a grayish coat, black vest, light pantaloons and slippers, and a white affair on his head, perhaps a handkerchief. His spiritual adviser stood behind him, evidently disgusted with him. Atzerodt lost his life through too much gabbing. He could have had serious designs upon nothing greater than a chicken, but talked assassination with the silent and absolute booth, until entrapped into conspiracy and the gallows much against his calculations. This man was visited by his mother, and a poor ignorant woman with whom he cohabited. He was the picture of despair, and died ridiculously, whistling up his courage. These were the dramatis personae, no more to be sketched, no more to be cross-examined, no more to be shackled, soon to be cold in their coffins. They were altogether a motley and miserable set. Rabbi might have looked well swinging in chains. Charlotte Corday is said to have died like an actress. Beale hung not without dignity. But these people, aspiring to overturn a nation, bore the appearance of a troop of ignorant folks expiating the bloodshed of a brawl. When General Hartranft finished reading, there was momentary lull, broken only by the cadences of the priests. Then the Reverend Mr. Gillette addressed the spectators in a deep, impressive tone. The prisoner, Lewis Thornton Powell, otherwise Payne, requested him to thus publicly and sincerely return his thanks to General Hartranft, the other officers, the soldiers, and all persons who had charge of him and had attended him. 
not one unkind word look or gesture had been given to him by any one dr gillette then followed in a fervent prayer in behalf of the prisoner during which payne's eyes momentarily filled with tears and he followed in the prayer with visible feeling rev dr olds followed saying in behalf of the prisoner david e herald that he tendered his forgiveness to all who had wronged him and asked the forgiveness of all whom he had wronged he gave his thanks to the officers and guards for kindnesses rendered him he hoped that he had died in charity with all men and at peace with god dr olds concluded with a feeling prayer for the prisoner rev dr butler then made a similar return of thanks on behalf of george a atzerott for kindness received from his guards and attendants and concluded with an earnest invocation in behalf of the criminal saying that the blood of jesus cleanses from all sin and asking that god almighty might have mercy upon this man the solemnity of this portion of the scene may be imagined the several clergymen speaking in order the dying testament of their clients and making the hot hours fresh with the soft harmonies of their benedictions the two holy fathers having received mrs surratt's confession after the custom of their creed observed silence in this as in other respects mrs surratt's last hours were entirely modest and womanly the stage was still filled with people the crisis of the occasion had come the chairs were all withdrawn and the condemned stood upon their feet the process of tying the limbs began it was with a shudder almost a blush that I saw an officer gather the ropes tightly three times about the robes of Mrs. Surratt and bind her ankles with cords. She half fainted and sank backward upon the attendants, her limbs yielding to the extremity of her terror, but uttering no cry, only a kind of sick groaning, like one in the weakness of fever, when a wry medicine must be taken. Payne, with his feet firmly laced together, stood straight as one of the scaffold beams and braced himself up so stoutly that this in part prevented the breaking of his neck harold stood well beneath the drop still whimpering at the lips but taut and short and boyish atzerott in his groveling attitude while they tied him began to indulge in his old vice of gabbing he evidently wished to make his finale more effective than his previous cowardly role and perhaps was strengthening his fortitude with a speech, as we sometimes do of dark nights with a whistle. Gentlemen, he said with a sort of choke and gasp, take where? He evidently meant beware or take care, and confounded them. Again, when the white death cap was drawn over his face, he continued to cry out under it, once saying, Goodbye, gentlemen, who is before me now? And again, may we meet in the other world finally he drifted away with low half intelligible ebullitions as god help me oh oh and the like the rest said nothing except mrs surratt who asked to be supported that she might not fall but harold protested against the knot with which he was to be dislocated it being as huge as one's double fist in fact, all the mechanical preparations were clumsy and inartistic, and the final scenes of the execution, therefore, revolting in the extreme. When the death caps were all drawn over the faces of the prisoners, and they stood in line in the awful suspense between absolute life and immediate death, a man at the neck of each adjusting the cord, the knot beneath the ears of each protruded five or six inches, and the cord was so thick that it could not be made to press tightly against the flesh so they stood while nearly a thousand faces from window roof wall yard and housetop gazed the scaffold behind them still densely packed with the assistants and the four executioners beneath standing at their swinging beams the priests continued to murmur prayers the people were dumb as if each witness stood alone with none nearby to talk to him an instant this continued while an officer on the plot before motioned back the assistants and then with a forward thrust of his hand signaled the executioners the great beams were darted against the props simultaneously the two traps fell with a slam 
the four bodies dropped like a single thing outside the yet crowded remnant of the gallows floor and swayed and turned to and fro here and there forward and backward and with many a helpless spasm while the spectators took a little rush forward and the ropes were taut as the struggling pulses of the dying mrs surratt's neck was broken immediately she scarcely drew one breath her short woman's figure with the skirts looped closely about it merely dangled by the vibration of her swift descent and with the knot holding true under the ear her head leaned sideways and her pinioned arms seemed content with their confinement pain died a horrible death the knot slipped to the back of his neck and bent his head forward on his breast so that he strangled as he drew his deep chest almost to his chin and the knees contracted till they almost seemed to touch his abdomen the veins in his great wrists were like whip cords expanded to twice their natural dimensions and the huge neck grew almost black with the dark blood that rushed in a flood to the circling rope a long while he swayed and twisted and struggled till at last nature ceased her rebellion and life went out unwillingly harold also passed through some struggles it is doubtful that his neck was broken the perspiration dripped from his feet and he swung in the hot noon just living enough to make death irritable atzerodt died easily life did not care to fight for his possession the two central figures lived long after the two upon the flanks there they hung bundles of carcass and old clothes four in a row and past all conspiracy or ambition the river rolling by without a sound and men watching them with a shiver while the heat of the day seemed suddenly abated as if by the sudden opening of a tomb the officers conversed in a half audible tone the reporters put up their books the assistants descended from the gallows and the medical men drew near no wind stirred the unbreathing bodies they were stone dead the bodies were allowed to hang about twenty minutes when surgeon otis u s v and assistant surgeons woodward and porter u s a examined them and pronounced all dead in about ten minutes more a ladder was placed against the scaffold preparatory to cutting the bodies down an overzealous soldier on the platform reached over and severed the cord letting one body fall with a thump when he was immediately ordered down and reprimanded the body of atzerodt was placed in a strong white pine box and the other bodies cut down in the following order harold powell and mrs surratt the carcasses thus recovered were given over to a squad of soldiers and each placed in a pine box without uncovering the faces the boxes were forthwith placed in the pits prepared for them and directly all but the memory of their offence passed from the recording daylight in the gloomy shadow of that arsenal lies all the motive and essay of a crime which might have changed the destinies of our race it will be forever a place of suspicion and marvel the haunted spot of the capital and the terror of all who to end a fancied evil cut their way to right with a dagger end of letter nine The Life, Crime, and Capture of John Wilkes Booth by George Alfred Townsend. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Extramural Scenes As everything connected with this expiation will be greedily read, I compile from gossip and report a statement of the last intramural hours of the prisoners. During the morning, a female friend of Atzerodt from Port Tobacco had an interview with him she leaving him about eleven o'clock. He made the following statement. He took a room at the Kirkwood house on Thursday in order to get a pass from Vice President Johnson to go to Richmond. Booth was to lease the Richmond Theater, and the President was to be invited to attend it when visiting Richmond and captured there. Harold brought the pistol and knife to the room about half-past two o'clock on Friday. He, Atzerodt, said he would have nothing to do with the murder of Johnson, when Booth said that Harold had more courage than Atzerodt, and he wanted Atzerodt to be with Harold to urge him to do it. There was a meeting at a restaurant about the middle of March, at which John Surratt, 
O'Laughlin, Booth, Arnold, Payne, Harold, and himself were present when a plan to capture the President was discussed. They had heard the President was to visit a camp, and they proposed to capture him, coach and all, drive through long old fields to T.B., where the coach was to be left and fresh horses were to be got, and the party would proceed to the river to take a boat. Harold took a buggy to T.B. in anticipation that Mr. Lincoln would be captured, and he was to go with the party to the river. Slavery had put him on the side of the South. He had heard it preached in church that the curse of God was upon the slaves, for they were turned black. He always hated the nigger, and felt that they should be kept in ignorance. He had not received any money from Booth, although he had been promised that if they were successful they should never want, that they would be honored throughout the South, and that they could secure an exchange of prisoners and the recognition of the Confederacy. Harold slept well several hours, but most of the night he was sitting up, either engaged with his pastor, Reverend Mr. Olds, of Christ Church, or in prayer. His sisters were with him from an early hour this morning to twelve o'clock, they being present when he partook of the sacrament at the hands of Dr. Olds. The parting was particularly affecting. Harold conversed freely with them, and expressed himself prepared to die. Powell conversed with Dr. Gillette and Dr. Stryker on religious topics during the morning, sitting erect as he did in the courtroom. From his conversation it appears that he was raised religiously, and belonged to the Baptist Church until after the breaking out of the rebellion. He appeared to be sincerely repentant, and in his cell shed tears freely. He gave his advisers several commissions of a private character, and stated that he was willing to meet his God, asking all men to forgive, and forgiving all who had done aught against him. Colonel Doster, his counsel, also took leave of him during the morning, as well as with Atzerodt. Mrs. Surratt's daughter was with her at an early hour. One of her male friends also had an interview with her, and received directions concerning the disposition of her property. During the night and morning she received the ministrations of Reverends J. A. Walter and B. F. Wiggett, and conversed freely with them, expressing, while protesting her innocence, her willingness to meet her God. Her counsel, Messrs. Aiken and Clampett, took leave of her during the morning. A singular feature of this execution was the arrest of General Hancock this morning, who appeared in court to answer a writ of habeas corpus, with a full staff. It is well to notice that this execution by military order has not, therefore, passed without civil protest. President Johnson extended to General Hancock the right conferred upon the President by Congress of setting aside the habeas corpus. As usual in such executions as this, there were many stirring outside episodes and much shrewd mixture of tragedy and business. A photographer took note of the scene in all its phases from a window of a portion of the jail. Six artists were present and thirty-seven special correspondents who came to Washington only for this occasion. The passes to the execution were written, not printed, and, excepting the bungling mechanism of the scaffold, the sorrowful event went off with more than usual good order. Everybody feels relieved tonight because half of the crime is buried. On Monday, Mudd, Arnold, O'Laughlin, and Spangler will go northward to prison the three former for life, the last for six years. Applications for pardon were made yesterday and today to President Johnson by Mrs. Samuel Mudd, who is quite woebegone and disappointed in behalf of her husband, by the sisters of Harold, and by Miss Anne Surratt. Harold's sisters, dressed in full mourning and heavily veiled, made their appearance at the White House for the purpose of interceding with the President in behalf of their brother. Failing to see the President, they addressed a note to Mrs. Johnson, and expressed a hope that she would not turn a deaf ear to their pleadings. Mrs. Johnson being quite sick, it was deemed expedient by the ushers not to deliver the note, when, as a last expedient, the ladies asked permission to forward a note to Mrs. Patterson, the President's daughter, which privilege was not granted, as Mrs. Patterson is also quite indisposed today. The poor girls went away with their last hope shattered. 
The misery of the pretty and heartbroken daughter of Mrs. Surratt is the talk of the city. The girl appears to have loved her mother with all the petulant passion of a child. She visited her constantly, and today made so stirring an effort to obtain her life that her devotion takes half the disgrace from the mother. She got the priest to speak in her behalf. Early today she knelt in the cell at her mother's feet and sobbed, with now and then a pitiful scream, till the gloomy corridors rang. She endeavored to win from pain a statement that her mother was not accessory, and as a last resort flung herself upon the steps of the White House and made that portal memorable by her filial tears. About half-past eight o'clock this morning, Miss Surratt, accompanied by a female friend, again visited the White House for the purpose of obtaining an interview with the President. The latter, having given orders that he would receive no one today, the doorkeeper stopped Miss Surratt at the foot of the steps leading up to the President's office and would not permit her to proceed further. She then asked permission to see General Muzzy, the President's military secretary, who promptly answered the summons and came downstairs where Miss Surratt was standing. As soon as the general made his appearance, Miss Surratt threw herself upon her knees before him, and catching him by the coat, with loud sobs and streaming eyes, implored him to assist her in obtaining a hearing with the president. General Muzzy, in as tender a manner as possible, informed Miss Surratt that he could not comply with her request, as President Johnson's orders were imperative and he would receive no one. Upon General Muzzy returning to his office, Miss Surratt threw herself upon the stair steps, where she remained a considerable length of time, sobbing aloud in the greatest anguish, protesting her mother's innocence, and imploring everyone who came near her to intercede in her mother's behalf. While thus weeping, she declared her mother was too good and kind to be guilty of the enormous crime of which she was convicted, and asserted that if her mother was put to death, she wished to die also. She was finally allowed to sit in the East Room, where she lay in wait for all who entered, hoping to make them efficacious in her behalf, all the while uttering her weary heart in a woman's touching cries. But at last, certain of disappointment, she drove again to the jail and lay in her mother's cell, with the heavy face of one who brings ill news. The parting will consecrate those gloomy walls. The daughter saw the mother pinioned and kissed her wet face as she went shuddering to the scaffold. The last words of Mrs. Surratt as she went out of the jail were addressed to a gentleman whom she had known. Goodbye. Take care of Annie. Tonight there is crepe on the door of the Surratts and a lonely lamp shines at a single window where the sad orphan is thinking of her bereavement. The bodies of the dead have been applied for, but at present will not be given up. Judge Holt was petitioned all last night for the lives and liberties of the condemned, but he was inexorable. The soldiers who hung the condemned were appointed against their will. I forbear to give their names, as they do not wish the repute of executioners. They all belonged to the 14th Veteran Reserve Infantry. Here endeth the story of this tragedy upon a tragedy. All are glad that it is done. I am glad particularly. It has cost me how many journeying to Washington, how many hot midnights in the telegraph office, how many gallops into wild places, and how much revolting familiarity with blood. The end has come. The slain, both good and evil, are in their graves, out of the reach of hangman and assassin. Only the correspondent never dies. He is the true pantheist, going out of nature for a week, but bursting forth afresh in a day, and so insinuating himself into the history of our era that it is beginning to be hard to find out where the event ends and the writer begins. Next week Ford's theatre opens with the Octoroon. The gas will be pearly as ever, the scenes as rich. The blood-stained footlights will flash as of old upon merry and mimicking faces. So the world has its tragic ebullitions, but its real career is comedy. Over the graves of the good and scaffolds of the evil sits the leering Momus, 
across whose face death sometimes brings sleep, but never a wrinkle. End of the Life, Crime, and Capture of John Wilkes Booth by George Alfred Townsend <laughs>